All right. Hello, Metatopia 2020. Uh, welcome to uh, the panel here that we're discussing uh, transmedia development for RPG designers. My name is Justin Achille. Uh, this is Gareth Michael Skarka. Hey, oh. everybody. <laughs> I need to silence this other window. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, I apologize. Uh, anyway, this is Gareth Michael Skarka. Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, Gareth, and then I will introduce myself. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Gareth Michael Skarka, and um, I just uh, need to silence a window there. There we go. And <laughs> I had the same problem. <laughs> yeah. And um, I've been working in uh, tabletop RPGs for uh, years. And um, I have also um, done some uh, transmedia development on a freelance basis. I've uh, worked as a consultant for a couple of studios. And um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Uh, I've been in commercial games for uh, almost that exact same number of years, in fact. Um, I began at White Wolf Game Studio down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, uh, White Wolf eventually merged with uh, CCP Games out of Iceland. Um, CCP uh, was looking to acquire an IP uh, to match with their uh, kind of technical background, so this was a, a, a good uh, kind of demonstration of taking existing media and moving it into uh, new venues, new formats. Um, since then, I uh, left CCP. I've worked at um, Funcom. I've worked at Ubisoft. And now I am doing the brand creative direction for uh, the World of Darkness for Paradox Interactive here in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Um, so uh, obviously, there's a lot of um, related work being done there. Uh, we kind of treat the TTRPG as uh, sort of the foundation um, that moves into other media there uh and so it's a, a good real life application of something starting as an rpg and moving into other media and being commercially viable commercially successful there um so uh i will kind of bounce the ball back to you gareth i know that you have a um kind of series of uh, blog posts that you wanted to uh, kind of reference and we, we can kind of compare and contrast uh, how those are, are still relevant today yeah, um, yeah. I, I had written a series of blog posts about ten years ago now. Um, uh, so a lot of this probably isn't uh, a lot of those information in the blog post aren't really uh, uh, valid anymore. But just in general, I think we should probably start off with telling these fine folks exactly what transmedia is. Um, the easiest. I mean, it's a horribly buzzwordy term. Um, and I think people just sort of settled on using it um, by virtue of there not really being anything better. <laughs> um, but, I mean, just to, to sort of ballpark it, it's storytelling across multiple forms of media that have, that, that create a, a wide variety of entry points by which people can interact with a particular property. Um, and importantly, where each, uh, platform stands on its own, you don't have to know the other stuff to appreciate it, but if you do, you get a little extra, uh, sort of bonus, you know, there, there, there are things that you'll appreciate that someone who doesn't know the other stuff won't catch necessarily. And I always tell people the, the, the best example back in the 60s and uh, 70s is basically just a franchise, right? They, they, like Star Trek, for example. Um, there were books, there were comics, there were toys, but they didn't talk to each other. You know, something that happened in the books didn't affect the comics, et cetera, et cetera. And then in 1978, there was a little something called, or actually 79, I think, uh, the Star Wars Holiday Special debuted. And in this notoriously awful <laughs> 70s variety show. With B. Arthur. 
with B. Arthur. <laughs> you can't you can't skip B. Arthur and Harvey Corman. Um, there was an animated segment that introduced a new character, a badass bounty hunter named Boba Fett. And every seven and eight year old watching lost their mind. The day after that aired, commercials rolled out that said that if you bought Star Wars action figures, you could get proofs of purchase off the back, mail them in, and they would send you a fat action figure. We did in our millions, and the action figure, of course, came in the box, had information about him on the back, right? Fast forward to 1980, Empire Strikes Back comes out, Boba Fett's on the screen, and every kid in that audience went apeshit because they knew who that was. They knew the background of him. Other people who, you know, were adults <laughs> just looked at that one. Oh, okay, it's a cool bad guy. Got it. But we knew the backstory, we, you know, and so it had a richer experience for us. And that was basically, for me anyway, the invention of transmedia. And they're, they're through the 80s, people sort of dipped their toe in it a little bit. Um, but it didn't really start taking off until the turn of the century, where you had people running. Um, well, like in the case of Lucasfilm, the story group. And they sort of orchestrate what goes on in the films, comics, books, etc., so that they all match, essentially. But yeah, that's basically the short, well, not so short version of it. <laughs> that's, that's a great example, actually, of, of transmedia. It's one of the, the ones that I go to as well. Um, I don't always use the term transmedia. Sometimes it helps to think of it as well as um, story brands. You know, if there's a kind of underlying story or underlying experience to have that can be had in a variety of different ways. And I think Star Wars is a fantastic one because there are so many different ways that you can get into Star Wars and all of them are inherently valid because they're basically about the audience experience of participating in Star Wars, right? You've got, you know, the movies, you've got comic books, you've got fiction, you've got toys, you've got, you know, merch tie-ins. Uh, and of course you have a huge variety of games that you can get into as well. Um, and one of the things that I think, uh, you know, put, putting a date on it, like you said, 78, 79, um, helps us realize that some of the most long-lived uh, transmedia brands are the ones that do have all of those points of ingress to them. Um, and here's where I like to contrast you know, Star Wars with all this huge variety of stuff to get into it um, with another uh, kind of um, nerd fan favorite, which is uh, Firefly, right? And so there weren't a huge amount of ways to get into Firefly. Like, yes, there was the show, and then briefly afterward, there came a licensed game, but there wasn't a whole lot of other ways to participate in Firefly or to you know, have other stories other than the show in Firefly. So comparatively few points of ingress for Firefly, while a huge amount of them for Star Wars, and look at the one that's still here today, right? Yeah. Um, another thing is that this concept actually goes back a lot further than we think it does. I didn't realize it until I started studying it, that whereas like in my personal life, 78, 79 is, is sort of the marker. If you go back to the 30s and 40s, um, there's this amazing book by Avi Santo, uh, S-A-N-T-O, for anybody who wants to write that down. It's called Selling the Silver Bullet, The Lone Ranger, and Transmedia Brand Licensing. And it talks about how the Lone Ranger in the 30s was a cross-media thing. And since it was all one owner, they cross-promoted and everything else. and. Uh, funny enough, the the radio show version of Superman, the producers saw what the Lone Ranger was doing, and they started introducing things in the radio show of Superman that eventually were picked up by the comic book. 
like the character of Jimmy Olsen, for example. But yeah, so this stuff, people have been sort of swimming in that pool for a while now. But, you know, what does this have to do with these fine people? Sure. Yeah, I mean, basically, the core skill set for transmedia storytelling is one which tabletop gamers are well-versed. I mean, it's world creation. We've spent the past, what, 30-odd years as an industry developing a very specific competency. And that's design and implementation of fictional settings that are designed to be interacted with by our player base. And that's tailor-made for transmedia development. I think that's actually a, a huge point right there. It's one of the things that uh, TTRPGs, games in particular, but TTRPGs, obviously, because that's what we're here talking about, um, they're meant to be interacted with. And part of the reason you get into transmedia is to experience the world, as you say. You know, the world has been built, and now you get to live in it um, as a player or as an audience member. And so the fact that these are built to be interacted with gives games, gives TTRPGs a huge uh, advantage over some other more traditional media. You know, for example, Star Wars started as a movie where the story is told to the audience, right? The audience has no participation. They have no real degree of expectation. They're watching this amazing thing happen, but they're not going to be able to interact with it. They're not going to be able to touch it, move the pieces around. Um, whereas when you start with a game, there's an inherent expectation that, you know, as a player, I'm going to interact with the world. And whether that is, you know, at the tabletop, rolling dice with a, a storyteller or GM, or whether that's through some other form of gaming, um, like through a video game or through, you know, a solo card game or board game or with other players in that format. But the worlds that we build are intended to be used by the audience as opposed to be the vehicle where we, or as the audience, passively receive the story. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, is... Uh, I gave a talk about this at, at a Story World conference in, in San Francisco, uh, I think five years ago now, six. Um, we <laughs> we have this, this uh, I was watching this presentation where this guy said, you know, creators are going to have to learn how to do this and nobody has this skill set. And I'm like, <laughs> I know a lot of people who have this skill set. <laughs> Let um, me list your 20. <laughs> yeah, just off the top of my head. No, um, but the funny thing is, is we, we tend to waste it by only producing our game, right? Which I, I liken to like, that, that's a single potential facet of an overall story world. And so it's a bit like having the know-how of how to design and build aircraft, but only using that knowledge to produce landing gear. It's, we should continue to create worlds, but we should produce games only as one small part of a larger effort. Because I know basically for a lot of designers, you know, you create your world and, and, and the, the sort of brass ring is to create fans, people who are really invested in that world. And if you do that, one, one of the way, I mean, one, you want to give them something else that they can experience. But also, if there is more than just the game, you have other methods to attract people to that property. So there is, I think, also an inherent value since um, we're talking about games when you um, build the world for the game. Um, one of the best ways to do it is to have the hooks there, like have have those points of interaction there. Um, and here I will provide kind of a, a practical example of uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s when I was at White Wolf in Georgia um, and we were doing tabletop RPGs, um, a lot of the knowledge we had about the player or the customer base was that uh, at least 50% of the people buying the books weren't actually playing the game. They were buying to uh, keep up with the storylines that we were producing there. Um, and so, you know, back at that time, I did a book on the Sabbat and I remember the Sabbat uh, history chapter was about 10,000 words. 
um, that wasn't necessarily built to be played, right? That was built to kind of have these backstories and have this kind of uh, rich history there. Um, whereas now, if I were producing a, an RPG supplement, um, I would put uh, much less emphasis on history and what that history is there. You know, by comparison, maybe only 2,000, 3,000 words of history, but all of that history then be actionable, right? And so if somebody wanted an actual history of this sect in the game, that's perhaps something that could be consumed in a different format other than a game supplement, right? There's very few opportunities to act in history, you know, unless somebody's writing a history, a historical session, <coughs> or unless somebody's character backstory provides an immediate opportunity to, oh, back in the 70s, he did this, and this is going to come to fruition tonight. Um, so, you know, what we're looking at here is as you're building game stuff, make that stuff actionable and let the kind of richer world stuff live in a uh, more um, kind of traditional media category. Um, so, you know, the players aren't necessarily expecting to act if they choose a, you know, novel that happens in the history of the world. Yeah, something more more presentational rather than interactive. Um, I mean, conventional wisdom has it that we, we present our stuff, uh, in RPGs anyway, as, you know, uh, the, the what I like to call the the the, the B A R the big ass rule book, and we look at it as being divided into crunch the the game stuff and fluff the 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 setting stuff, and what what I think that designers should do is they should take the fluff. And concentrate on developing that because that's the 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 brand, you know, that's the story world, and that's the central content that you then leverage through various other formats. Um, and in many and, cases, that's the reason that the audience is there, right? They yeah. want the world, and whether or not you have ten dice to do this or four dice to do this with a big plus. I mean, that's, you know, that's a question of game design, but that's not necessarily what people are going to stick around for. To, to use, to, to use uh, 90s White Wolf as an example, people were buying those books for the world, not for, I can't wait to see what they do with the, the dice pool system next. Right, right, exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so... Basically, the best way to go about doing this, I mean, it's like hard, hardcore, um, actionable stuff. You've already designed your game. You have the setting for that game. And I think that the first step for somebody in that position is to create a sort of centralized, branded website as, you know the sort of all in one place where you can find stuff, you know, um, and branded for the property, not you, if that makes sense. Um, you know, don't, don't do like, you know, www.yourcompany.com slash new transmedia hotness do www.newtransmediahotness.com. Right. The, the goal here is to create fans of your setting, your, your, I mean, I hate using the word brand, but that's what it is. Um, and even yeah. there, it's, it's a question of knowing who your audience is um, for many, uh, especially younger audiences. Um, that destination might not actually be a freestanding website. It might be your YouTube channel. Right. Mm -hmm. Or the or the Reddit community, um, you know, depending on where, you know, your audience is likely to go. You need to custom tailor that to how they are most familiar and comfortable with consuming uh, that that brand or that that, you know, I, I hate the word content, too, because it's yeah. kind of a <laughs> generic pile of stuff somebody made. But I, can, I, I feel my soul leaking out of my ears <laughs> every time I use terms like that. But um, no, but at, uh, it's a good point that the. the what the central, the central, um, <laughs> what the core is, isn't as important as the fact that a core exists. They, that you've got, that basically 
think of it like um, like funnels. And each of your things, like the game or uh, novels or web videos or whatever, each of those is sort of a, a hole that will funnel people to your central thing where they can meet other people who are into it. They can discover all of the stuff that existed that they didn't. They can discover the other entry points that are different from their entry point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. That's, that's hugely relevant because for so much of TTRPG's history, they've been this thing that, oh, you know somebody who gets you into it, right? Like, you know, for me, it was my cousin. I was literally playing D&D &D in my cousin's basement, you know, and then uh, I fell out of games for a while and then got back into it because uh, a, a girlfriend at the time told me, oh, there's this game where you can, it's kind of like Anne Rice, like, oh, I know what those, what those games are, um, you know, so... I think now there is less of a, or the, the proportion of people who get into it through a friend of a friend is less than uh, it was historically now. Like, for example, for World of Darkness, there's a huge amount of people who have come to the World of Darkness through LA by Night, you know, through the, the, the game that's being streamed uh, online. And so even if they never play the game, even if they never want to play the game, they're doing things like watching the show. They're doing things like creating, uh, you know, artwork about the characters. There have been poems written about these things. You know, they, they choose to write summaries. And again, you know, back to those, those points of ingress there. Now, if they're getting into the game or getting into the brand, not through through playing the game itself, but through watching other people play the game, and then their destination is that website that's hosting those videos, right? Right. Um, basically, I mean, um, there is a thing which I keep in my head. Um, Mike Masnick from the website Tech Dirt um, did a 15-minute presentation at the uh, the Medemnet conference in Cannes and it was all about being a creative in the 21st century and how you can generate a living uh, in an age of pirating downloads and shrinking economies and whatnot and it he just put it up on the wall it was this formula which was CWF plus RTB equals dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. And that stood for connection with fans plus reason to buy equals business model. And it's, it's a fairly basic concept. It's like you get people to become fans of your thing. And then show them other things that relate to that, that they want. I mean, and it's basically what we've been doing anyway, just, just sort of restricted to the game space. You know, a gamer becomes a fan of a line and they purchase it. And then a percentage of those gamers become fans of the line who go on to purchase supplemental releases, etc. So we've got the connection with fans bit down pretty well um and there's even a point there where maybe you know if you can afford it reduce that barrier to entry you know give the game away right right and this is this is the kind of uh uh, razors model, right? Like give the game away, you know, sell the supplements or, you know, sell or, participation. Or, or heroin and, model, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so exactly right. Um, the game is free, but, uh, you know, buy the novel or, you know, pay, buy a ticket to see the movie or, um, and this is kind of in parallel with, um, there is a, a much more modern idea or, or younger audiences are generally greater, more appreciative of having experiences than they are necessarily of having objects, right? And so, you know, a lot of times you'll hear games as a service used as a dirty word because it sounds like, you know, people out there are trying to kind of grab a buck from you. Um, but if the player is really enjoying the experience of living in the world, they don't necessarily care whether they have a box to put on their shelf, right? And so, you know, this is that outgrowth of transmedia. You know, if you can turn your game property to something like a Disney World or obviously, you know, huge example there, but, you know, pay to attend LARPs 
are, are you know, basically expressions of this as well. They're not necessarily buying the rules and going home with a set of rules. They're, you know, buying participation for that weekend or at that convention. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, and that, that segues perfectly. That's, we know the connection with fans part. We're used to doing that. We, we talk to them on social media or on forums. Uh, we, we interact with them at conventions. Where we fall down is the reasons to buy. Because right now, basically, we're, we're kind of stuck in the if we build it, they will come kind of, well, here's more for my game. That's not really giving them a reason to buy. That's just giving them more of the same reason, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but that's how it's worked for decades, right? So there, you, you need to give them more reasons than just because it's there. And what you said about about younger audiences being more experienced, you know, wanting experiential stuff rather than stuff. Um, I wa- I, I um, went down a, a deep rabbit hole on this stuff, and uh, I was lucky enough. I live in Lawrence, Kansas, which is where the University of Kansas is. There is a communications professor. Um, Dr. Nancy Bame, who is a professor of communication studies. And it was, it was funny. I was actually just reading up on all of this stuff and stumbled across her and then realized, oh, she's here. So I, I, I spoke with her. She basically, she did a, a study of the psychology of fandom. And we we all really i mean at our core we know what it is it it's that fans on some level assume a level of of ownership of the object of their fandom that they, they view it as their thing you know and of course you know from a from a designer standpoint that can also be a problem cuz you know people will tell you that you're doing it wrong you know <laughs> but if we can give them things or experiences which speak directly to that sense of ownership, that sort of um, tribal identity, that gives a very compelling reason to get on board. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? I mean, so much of playing games is playing games with people, right? right. So not only when we get together to play a cowboy game or play D&D or play vampire, you know, we not only have the game in common, we're all enthusiasts of the setting as well. And so now, I mean, that's that reminds me of um, meeting friends, like being in music subcultures. You know, you go out and you, when you see concerts, you see the same people at every concert. And so, you know, you like going to concerts and you like this particular band. So you've already got some of that social glue that's happening mm-hmm. there that's you know keeping people together and in many cases that's uh, even beyond that you know hey here's another album right it, it answers yeah. more of the reason to buy like you enjoy spending time with your friends and you enjoy this music you know so here's yeah. a new album for you a lot of nancy's work uh was uh, uh using the um the 80s and 90s underground scene as her example of fans of bands creating zines and uh, bootlegs and, you know, communicating with pre-internet and that the internet, the ability to find your tribe exploded. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. the, and, and White Wolf really, really was smart. Although, Having talked to Mark, I, I, I know that it, it's not, it wasn't originally intentional. They thought it just sort of fell into it. The, the, the sort of um, adjacent fandom of, of gothic, uh, gothic punk music ended up sort of blurring the line there. And you had a lot of cross pollinization. 
Very true. Very true. And that's, I think, because um, the game focused on some of the themes that that subculture had in common. You know, there was a, a love of the, the dark, beautiful aesthetic. You know, there were things that uh, the, the Venn diagrams for these crossed over yeah. a lot. All right. So, yeah, basically what we're saying as we'll we'll sort of pivot now towards, OK, this is what we're saying you should do. How? <laughs> Um, what we're saying is create your story world and have the game be part of that, but do other things too. Um, so what, what about the content? You know, what, what do you do if you have this, this story world? I think the easiest thing for most designers um, is fiction. Because really, I mean, we're, for most of our, our product, we're already producing books. So we have that, that sort of core skill set, right, of, of how to put together a book and get it out. Um, you know, and if, you're, if you don't think that you know, your, your fiction jobs are up to it, do what you do with games. If there's something you can't do, you hire a freelancer. And there are plenty of people that would jump at the chance. Uh, especially if you've already got the game out. That's That actually is a, a, a way to draw fans in who want to make that jump from to, from fan to, to co-creator. You know? Co-creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. That ties into this, this, this question here that I see in the chat, um, how to do it at a reasonable cost. Um, and so one of the things that I'd like to uh, focus on, on that question there, obviously all of this stuff needs to be created. Um, but to your point, you know, Gareth, the, the fiction there was an example. I think, you know, not necessarily to keep costs down, but what you'd want to do is create something, what your next bit of transmedia that is the most valuable. You know, what is the thing that gets more people into your transmedia? So it's less about, you know, the cost proper and it's more about spending wisely. You know, if you have a really literary audience, fiction is a great uh, opportunity, right? If you have a uh, an audience, if, if people really enjoy your Let's Plays, Obviously, you're going to get more out of your um, streamed games or you know recorded games than you necessarily would for fiction, right? So uh, coming at it from the perspective of what does this give to my audience? What does this give to the player? What is the reason to buy? And sometimes the reason to buy is they consume this you know on the way to school or on the way to work or idly while they're doing you know homework or whatever, and that you know they just let it run in the background or they're watching it on mobile. So in a case like this, you know. Maybe fiction is less expensive to produce, but you'd get more people satisfied for longer from that stream. Um, so let's say that's a really yeah. great question um, from Mopop there. Um, but I think, you know, it's addressing what gives you the most bang for your buck as opposed to how to control the cost overtly. Right. I mean, and, and here's another one of those soul destroying terms. You're looking at a return on investment, you know, ROI. It's, you, you, when I first started doing transmedia stuff, I, I had said that that video um, was another way to do it because of people being able to, to, to consume it passively rather than, you know, like you said, on the bus or whatever. Um, but I wrote that I, I got into that so early that one of my predictions was that we were going to have um, high bandwidth um, Wi-Fi proliferate and video was going to become much a much bigger thing. Streaming streaming games wasn't even on the radar at that point. Um, and so, like, you know, a lot of people are like, well, how how do you make a movie? you don't really have to make a movie anymore. You can literally just do a bunch of people playing your game on video and people will watch it. 
Um, mm-hmm. Telling which, the story of the movie, you know, it's yeah. not the movie, it's the. And and when I first heard about it, I, I first heard you know, everybody, a lot of people's entry into that was Critical Role. My, my you know, old man yells at Cloud <laughs> was, who who's going to watch something like that? They watch people play D and D. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, but I'm a huge Star Trek fan. And when I was doing some freelance for Modifius on the new Star Trek game, uh, Chris Birch told me that there was going to be a group of players in LA who were going to play the Star Trek game like Critical Role was playing D and D, and I went, "Oh, all right, I'll give it, I'll give it a go." And a group of people who, at the time, were were working for Nerdist, um, did a, a stream of the game, but like they got a Novos to send them like uniform jackets, and they built a backdrop. The producers of Voyager gave them a PDF of their set blueprints and said, yeah, go ahead. And so they were, for for lack of a better word, in costume, Uh (laughs) in in front of a Star Trek-looking backdrop, and it was called Shield of Tomorrow. And the funny thing was, is by the time they finished it, and they did bring it to a close, they had produced more hours of Star Trek than all seven seasons of Next Gen and their movies. <laughs> and in a weird way, it, it became one of my favorite iterations of Star Trek. Like, like with every other series, I fell in love with characters and I wanted to see what happened to them next. And I didn't even really think about the fact while I was watching it, that I was just essentially sitting in someone's living room watching them play an RPG. And so I'm not saying that you have to, like, you know, go in costume and have massive production values. I mean, if you just do a podcast, and, I mean, there are there are free sound effects and even, like, royalty-free music and stuff that you could edit in. And even the production tools themselves, right? Like making yeah. a podcast is, there are plenty of free tools out there. Yeah, there's tons of free free uh, tools. And something like that is something that people can listen to in their car on their commute or when they're going to bed at night just sort of to chill out a little bit and decompress. You know, and even there, I, it becomes a question of of the the format of consumption too. Like, you can take a four hour game session and edit it down to an hour, so it plays more like a you know a radio drama for the player who or for the audience that is only interested in the story developments. Or you can leave it in its full three to four hour format for the players who enjoy, or for the audiences that enjoy watching the players interact with one another. They like seeing the systems happen on the table. You know, we've we've had uh, both of those. I've, I'm familiar with both of those kinds of media, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We are in a position right now when there is so, so many tools that are available to an individual creator that boggles the mind. And I mean, the, like you said, and a lot of it is free. I mean, even pro level tools like Photoshop and Illustrator and things like that, there are competitors who are who have released open sourced free versions, essentially. I mean, they're they're not the same, but they do the same things. Yeah, you know, like you know, you don't have to go and get. Adobe InDesign to do your layout, you can get Affinity Designer, which is free. You don't have to do, you know, produce 
printable 3D miniatures. You don't need like a commercial uh, computer assisted design program. You can use Blender, which is free. Mm -hmm. And now, the, I mean, Blender now can even be used for 2D animation. And there are tutorials on how to use all of this stuff all over YouTube. Because, I mean, if you guys run your things the way I run mine and our, our you know, the sort of watchword was do what you can do yourself so you don't have to pay someone else to do it. If you don't know how to do something, learn how to do it. Or get a freelancer, you know, hire mm -hmm. an artist. <clears throat> yeah, I think that speaks to one of the points that's happening in the in the chat here too. Is you know, your your first uh, when you, you're not going to do it well at first, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that even gets outside of the realm of of uh, transmedia specifically. Like, get your failures out of the way. Go ahead and be crappy at first. Um, you know, build your skills, uh, design in particular, whether you're building a game specifically or a, a world overall is an iterative process. And so you're going to have things that, okay, I know it's not this. Okay, now I know it's not this. Okay, now I know it's not this. And so, you know, you, you're not going to be able to do this from day zero and say, okay, here we go. I'm going to flawlessly, flawlessly do it at the gate, right? You need to, but think about this. Part of the reason going to Metatopia is to, is to play test and get feedback. Right. Think, think of it uh, of this for an example, though. In the late 70s, music had gotten sort of up its own ass, and it was heavily produced and like long, complex compositions, and, and punk musicians had almost no musical skill. And there was the 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 back of the zine ad, the famous one that they talk about, which is they that this is a G chord, this is an A chord, this is a C chord. Now go start a band. Uh, yeah. And people and people did, and they sucked, but people loved it. So don't just automatically assume, well, I can't do this well. No one's gonna. Got, no one's going to become a fan of this because I suck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, back to, that's part of the value proposition, right? Like they, yeah. these the, the songs that were being written in that punk movement were speaking to the politics of the time. Um, they were providing a community, you know, so you got together with the other punks that you knew. I mean, half of the bands that became famous met each other at the other half's gigs, right? Yeah. So, you know, they came together by having that common interest. Yeah, never, never underestimate the value of being genuine you know that can create fans just as much as virtuosity you know you don't have to be a an amazing uh video editor to put something up on youtube but if what you're saying and what you're presenting speaks to somebody they're going to be receptive to it. Yes, yes. You don't have to have the best art in the world. You don't have to design the world's best game. Um, in fact, you could have the world's best game and the world's best art. And if it doesn't speak to anybody, who cares how good, you know, technically the art and the game design is? You know, what is the, what is the, the value that is bringing people there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that, that Justin like me has a box somewhere with tons of convention swag traded games that that you got from some new company that came out and produced an absolutely gorgeous object that didn't sell and they're not around anymore i mean uh, 20 years of gen con or whatever i've got more than i care to to count yep Yep. But when you look at what's going on in the indie movement, there are people who are like, okay, I am purposefully producing 
a minimalist game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be done within, you know, 64 pages. I'm not going to use any art. Ashcan production. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and they have an audience. And part of that gets into the long tail thing. You know, the, the, was a was a theory put forth by um, former Wired editor Kevin Kelly, where he described essentially um, <laughs> internet consumer behavior, and he described it as basically being, you know, over here you have things which interest a lot of people that a lot of people will buy, and then it goes like that. And, but the thing is, is that, you know, the further you get along this angle, there are fewer people, right? And subsequently, the less uh, money or, or whatever you can get out of that interest. But the thing that he noticed is, is that it never reaches zero. Mm, okay. And so the idea being... And it falls back into that idea of, of tribal identity, you know, of being belonging to something. You can find people who are going to be interested in what you do. And that's, you, you, you figure out, um, you figure out what it is that speaks to them and you're golden. And, and I mean, I'm not saying that that's easy, you know, or that you will be rich necessarily doing it. Oh God, no. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, um, there's a, a web comics guy, uh, Howard Taylor, who did, a, a he just wrapped it up actually a, a sci-fi web comic called schlock mercenary. And if you look on uh, YouTube, he did a talk in 2008 at the Utah Open Source Conference uh, talking about the, the, the free content business model, which is what he was doing, and he was making a living on it and did for the next 12 years. And the... The talk is about 30 minutes in length if you can find it, but but basically what he ended up saying was the the for a creative now, making a living is basically like a recipe for for grizzly bear soup. <laughs> First, you have to find, hunt, stalk, fight, and kill a grizzly bear. And then after that, it's just a soup recipe. <laughs> the grizzly bear is getting people into what you do. Uh, for lack of a better word, creating fans. Once you've done that, the hard part's over. The, the, the hard part is creating fans. Once you've got fans, give them experiences. Give them things. Find out what they want. What, what attracts them to what you do. And, and from there, it's just a soup recipe. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the, to, to get completely crass with it, um, you know, looking at it on a, on a model called ARM, right? First there's, there's acquisition, there's getting those players, then there's retention, which is keeping those players. And then there's the monetization, right? Then there's the yeah. keeping the lights on with it. And nobody wants to, 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 think of it as monetize, monetizing your fan base, but that's exactly what it is. And, you know, I mean, unless it's a complete be, labor of love, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if you're Which not is trying also to... valid. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the fact is, is that we, you know, we talked earlier about how, how fans have this sort of tribal identity, right? That, you know, the, and that this is their thing. Merch. Merch can be one of your transmedia platforms. 
I mean, in the in the early '90s, White Wolf did a a brisk business in T-shirts. Sure did. And I I would be willing to bet that it was a pretty significant uh, column on the on the spreadsheet. Uh, maybe even as significant as the rule book sales. And it was uh, also fed into that tribal identity, not in a sense that was um, avaricious, right? You know, people wanted to proclaim their allegiance. They wanted to yeah. say, I like this vampire clan or I enjoy this game. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, other, other expressions of merch are, you know, if you have unique dice that are available for your game or, you know, a pin that indicates a faction of the game that you can wear on clothing or, you know, have on at the table and, you know, things like that, that, that augment that experience as opposed to like pick at it, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, you don't have to be crass about it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, getting into the, how do you do that? With print on demand now, you can do all of this without any cash outlay. There are services like Printful and others. I mean, Cafe Press, Zazzle, I mean, I could rattle them off. All you have to do is upload a design, and they'll do all of the back end. And you which, can is, which is hugely beneficial, right? Like you don't have to print too many and all of a sudden you're sitting on thousands of unused shirts and you don't yeah. have to ship them and you don't have to pay tax on, on uh, inventory that you've got in your warehouse. Like, no, no, no. If you're doing no. it on a budget, let someone else do that. <laughs> and, 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 they, and all of them have tools allowing you to basically put it on your website, which sends it to their back end. So, so they handle the sale, they handle the tax, etc. They print the shirt and send it to your customer, send you the, the leftover money. You know, they get their cut and you just make more stuff. And I, you know, I always thought of print on demand as books and shirts. And then I looked at what's actually available. And it's insane. I mean, if you wanted to produce, you know, a vampire shower curtain, you could do that. I don't know or, why you do that. Even now, you know, we, we, we have um, relevant merch. I mean, the, the, while everyone's wearing masks, there are masks with clan identities on them, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And it sounds, you know, silly, but people who love your story world your brand that's the kind of stuff that they like to pick up you know iphone cases or and all of that it, it doesn't to have put to, on laptops yeah it doesn't have to 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 pull you away from what you got into this to do because it's it's so easily done and can be done in a lot of cases with existing assets that you already have. Mm. You know, if you came up with a really kick-ass logo for your game, you got a t-shirt, you know? And it also allows you to sort of spread your, your costs out a bit too. You know, yeah. if, you, if you've paid an artist for a really great illustration, Contract it so that you have the ability to use it for promotional. Yes. I was just about to say, make sure that's yeah. in the contract. You got to do it right. Make sure yeah. that the, the other creatives and, get yeah. paid. And you know, uh, and and it's it's uh, Mark Wade, uh, the comic book writer, talked about the 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 life of a creative in the 21st century because of all of these tools that are now available to us. And he said, nobody's going to get rich, but everybody will get paid. And it, it, that's enough. I mean, it was um, the, the same guy who talked about the long tail thing also had the, the, the thousand true fans idea. And what that was, and he was talking about musicians at the time, is that 
to do this as your job, all you need are a thousand true fans. And he defined a true fan as somebody who was willing to spend a hundred dollars a year on whatever it is you do. And if you can find a thousand of those people, that's a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's a good living pretty much anywhere in the US. You're not gonna get, you know, rock star rich, but you'll be able to do what you love for a living. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. a lot that that is a huge, huge thing. And you need to make sure that that's actually what you want to do. That if you, you mm -hmm. actually want to work, for, you know, turn the thing you love into work. Cause for some people yeah. that can be extremely demotivating. That's actually a really excellent point. Um, as a friend, a friend of mine, I got into the business with, um, back in the nineties said, uh, he, he was in for, he was in for like five years or so. And then he just dropped out and hasn't, he just been working a nine to five and he still plays. He plays more than I do. And he said, I turned my play into work and I didn't have play anymore because he yeah. couldn't, he yeah. couldn't sit down at the table and, and look at a game without thinking, wonder where they got this printed. Oh, that artist, I wonder if they're available. <laughs> you know, but, or, or looking at it and going, oh man, I know the guy who designed this, he's a jerk, you know? Once you knew how the sausage got made, he wasn't enjoying it anymore. So Very he stopped. I risk, yep. Yeah, so he stopped. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about doing this from a from a sort of a business standpoint. The first question you have to ask yourself is, do you want to just get a game out there and have people playing it, or do you want to actually make a living from it? That's and even there, there's there's you know viable commercial ways to do it. If all you want to do is is make the game first or create the world. You can sell your share of interest in it, right? Or you can uh, monetize it other ways. It doesn't have to be you doing it. Um, and mm -hmm. you'll see this a lot with, uh, you know, uh, people will purchase board games outright. You know, we'll, we want to buy this game from you and then we'll develop it and publish it. They're not necessarily always the designer, right? They are a right. developer, a publisher, a manufacturer, et cetera. And, and um, another, another example is the, the idea of, Yep, oh, I lost it. <laughs> I was going to say something, and then I started listening to what you were saying, and I was like, oh, yeah, 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 the, that that too. Um, if, you, if you just want to uh, – Patreon is available now, and I would love to see somebody use that as their model, that basically, like, give their game away for free And then have a subscription-based Patreon where all you do is is produce more stuff for people who want it, but it only goes out on the Patreon. I mean, because that wasn't around when I first started getting into this. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a great test of the thousand true fans model too. That yeah, you know, what's what's the threshold that that becomes sustainable, right? Yeah. All right. Does anyone have any more questions? I think we're good. I'm not getting any indication that anyone is typing. So, <laughs> well, but yeah, I should uh, that there there is a 20 second delay, so I would give it another yeah, minute. <laughs> that's true. Um, Mr. Radical Bomb back early it said that I uh, feel like Watsi is getting good at this. That you play a published adventure and you run into people that you read about in the books, and that you can get board games set in the same world and now they're they're sort of cross-pollinating their magic and D, D customer bases it's true i mean <laughs> when you have a giant corporation behind you this becomes way easier um recently it, within the past couple of years we've seen movie studios releasing pdf 
RPGs based on their properties as a marketing expense. And it was free, you know, licensed RPGs used to be, you know, you have to pay a ridiculous amount of money and you release a game and they take a cut of your sales and it's a huge headache. And and sometimes and you, they even need to, uh, when they have the approval stage, there's a, a story, I won't, I won't say who it is, but there was uh, one publisher that had a license that had to pay someone to read the game on behalf of the licensor because the licensor was not going to read this 350 page rule book about their game. You know, it just, it, it wasn't worth the time that, you know, their ROI wasn't as good for it. So, you know, they had to contract this third party to give a summary that would said, yes, this, this game is worth the stamp of approval. Right. Okay, and, guys, and as we're wrapping up, don't forget to tell everybody where they can find you so that they can follow you and purchase your things. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, yeah, but so like, like, for example, the, the, Netflix um, fairy urban fantasy story whose title is completely escaping me at the moment. They Oh, the produced, Amazon one? Yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. Carnival Row? Yeah. Carnival Row produced a PDF RPG as advertisement. So um, I think that brings us to the end of our time. Cool. Um, if you want to uh, talk to a us further uh best way to reach me is on twitter at gm scarka you i'll type in the chat so you can see how it's spelled and you same for me uh i'm uh jay achille at twitter so j-a-c-h-i-l-l-i i'll put it in here too um or you can keep up with the world of darkness at worldofdarkness.com and thank Thanks you so much so much yep Bye-bye.